What were the effects of COVID-19 fiscal policies at the firm, the sector, the country and the global level? A new discussion paper collects together what we know about which policies worked and which didn't. Hello again, Shebnam. Nice to speak to you again. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good. Now, Shebnam, tell me about this research. You've looked at the global impact of fiscal policies, and to do that, you need to include a lot of countries in your data. What countries were you able to include? Are they all advanced economies? We actually have a mixture of advanced economies and emerging markets, Tim. So we work with 27 countries. Out of these 27, 18 advanced economies and nine emerging markets. And when you look across those different economies, was the fiscal response more or less the same? How much difference was there? Oh, this is a big deal, Tim. Fiscal response nowhere uh, were the same. Huge differences that goes back to the heart of this issue we call fiscal space. Advanced economies, rich countries, they have a lot of fiscal space and they uh, were able to spend a lot. Across uh, 18 advanced economies, uh, the average uh, spending is 15% of G their GDP. But unfortunately, when we look at our emerging markets, across our nine emerging markets, the average fiscal spending is only around 5% of their GDP. A big difference, actually. Big difference. Absolutely. And uh, the, the question you ask in your paper, let me read it here, is fiscal policy, does it get in all of the cracks? Now, tell me what these cracks are and tell me what happens if it doesn't get into them. Okay, so we look at these things in uh, two steps, basically. That's how uh, our uh, cracks uh, analogy uh, comes from. First, we want to understand the firm failures, especially what we call SMEs, small, medium enterprises. Why is that? If you uh, recall, at the uh, early phase of the pandemic, governments rushed to save these firms because these firms are small. They cannot get easily to banks or to even larger bond markets and equity markets. And they got a direct shock to their earnings and their liquidity, right? So this is the entire restaurants story, service sector story and all that. So governments rush with these programs, uh, both in you know Europe and United States and other countries, advanced and emerging market alike, to save these uh, firms. So the first part of the paper, we look at, okay, so government put all these programs together. There are over 500 programs in over 30 countries to help these small, medium enterprises. Was this policy successful? Did they save the firms? That's the first part, the first crack, if you will. And then after that, you know, we realized that governments also did a lot of fiscal stimulus, fiscal spending, mostly in forms of just sending checks to households, right? These transfers uh, that we have seen widely in many countries. Then the second part, we want to look at that. Okay, what, it, what about the effect of these transfers to households? They're supposed to spend this, right? That's the idea to stimulate the economy. Uh, how successful was that? So that's uh, basically uh, our crack analogy here. Overall, uh, uh, Tim, we find that actually policies uh, were successful. Uh, they did get into the cracks. You know, they did save firms. They uh, definitely increased demand and spending from consumers. Uh, but everybody's fiscal policy on its own. So it's kind of a this domestic thing, right? So if you are a country you spend a lot, like US, Germany, you are getting into your own domestic cracks, right? So you are successful in your own country. Generally, we tend to think these things as having international spillovers. We don't find that. So basically, going back to your question, what would have happened if they didn't get into the cracks? Of course, every country would have been in a worse position. So in that sense, fiscal policy is successful, was successful, right? They got into their own domestic cracks. But at the end of the day, we are still in this crisis. It is a global crisis. And given this inequality in fiscal space, if you're a country who can spend a lot, you fill your domestic cracks, but not help that much to the others. So if you're a country that, who cannot do that, an emerging market, developing country, you are still in trouble. Tell me, first of all, then, about the policy to save firms. Uh, how successful was that? How many firms are in business now that wouldn't have been successful without the fiscal interventions? Overall, among these 27 countries we study, 
we uh, found uh, a counterfactual failure rate, meaning in the absence of fiscal policy of nine percentage point increase. So from non-COVID to COVID, you are increasing the failure rate of your SMEs nine percentage points. This didn't happen because fiscal policy came in. So the success of fiscal policy is halving that. So with the fiscal policy, with this help to directly targeting the, to save the firms, that nine percentage point increase in the failure rate didn't happen, and it only uh, happened four percentage points. So you are halving, basically, with these support programs, your failure rate. But notice the difference between, again, the rich nations, advanced economies, and the poor nations, emerging markets, and developing countries. When we focus only on these advanced economies, it's a full offset. Basically, your counterfactual failure rate, which is around like six percentage point, goes to zero. You completely offset it. But in emerging markets, the counterfactual failure rate was around 12 percentage point. You only uh, reduce it uh, around not to nine. So because again, why? Because you just cannot spend that much. You don't have that type of fiscal space in emerging markets and developing countries. All this year, though, Shadna, I've been talking to people about zombie firms. I worry that we are saving the wrong kind of firms and that the money that is being used in these fiscal policies is going to the wrong type of firms. What does your research tell you about those questions? We look at those questions. They are very important questions. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. The, the money, there is definitely wasted money here. There is definitely inefficiency here. Why? Because these policies weren't targeted. I mean, most of these policies put together in a week. You have to put together a policy in a week. There is no way. This is battlefield, right? You cannot do medical surgery in a battlefield. There is no way you can go and find out, like using a, you know, to be oh, let me say that firm, let me not say that firm. That firm is a zombie. The other one is a good firm. So this didn't happen. So in that sense, just this money flux, influx of money came and it went to, uh, you know, a lot of firms actually who didn't need it. So in, instead of going to zombies, it went to a lot of viable firms. Those firms could have survived without that much money, but they got it. So that's the untargeted nature of the policies and the inefficiency and the waste associated with these policies. In terms of zombies, actually, the, that's the silver lining. We didn't find that much of a zombification. I mean, like you, I also heard this all year uh, and, you know, read it a lot in, in, in the popular media. One of the reasons why we look at that question, you know what, let's just sit down and do this right. And we didn't find uh, that much zonification. Only, you know, uh, two percentage of the funds uh, went to those firms. And at the end of the 2021, how many of the firms you saved in 2020 zombies, we find that only 13%. Uh, so, uh, and the fail, but even they all fail at the end of 2021, your failure rate is just increasing incrementally another two percentage points. So zombification by no means is, is, a, is an issue that happened to be an issue and, uh, uh, this extensively as we were fearing. And why, why is that? I think that's because this crisis, firms learned their lesson and they entered with stronger balance sheets, stronger financial positions, as opposed to 2008, 2009 story, right? I mean, that's partly uh, the case. Of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity here. Uh, a country like Italy is going to have more weaker firms in terms of financial positions than a country like Germany. So there is a lot of country and sector heterogeneity too, which we document in the paper. But overall, we didn't find this wall of bankruptcy zombification of the economies. Okay, so let's have a look at it from the other end the other dimension of fiscal policies to stimulate demand. How much of the global economy did you find was demand constrained during this time? This is very uh, important. We uh, have this other model. We work with two models. One is this model that allows us to, to look at the firm failures and the other one is like what is going on globally in a global model to economic activity with this type of stimulus. And we find that actually, you are exactly right, 31% of the global GDP here, it is our 27 countries, globe is our 27 countries, is demand constrained, right? So this is very important because that is something that fiscal stimulus can uh, solve, right? I mean, there is low demand, there is slack, and you can improve that demand. But of course, we should never lose the sight of the fact that COVID shock is a very different shock. It is a demand shock and a supply shock at the same time. Does this mean the 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 stimulus aspect of fiscal policy just wasn't working it is going to work in a limited sense it means that right so 31 percent of the uh you know sectors is demand, demand constraint means the rest is supply constraint right and what fiscal policy did is 
to solve that demand problem and reallocating actual labor uh, towards those sectors. So that is another success so that we count and one of the other uh, getting into domestic cracks because you can, you know, employ, you can reallocate your employment from the sector supply constraint to demand constraint when the demand constraint sector consumers demanding more. That's a good thing, right? Because you are sustaining aggregate employment. So you are helping to the unemployment problem. You are decreasing unemployment. You are sustaining aggregate employment. But of course, you are only be able to stimulate demand in those sectors. The traditional fiscal multipliers are going to be low, right? That's exactly as uh, you guessed him. So there is going to be a limit to what fiscal policy can do in this world. Look ahead for me, Shevnam, as best as you can. Since this paper came out, we've seen a dramatic effect of the Omicron variant, and that has pointed out the difference in vaccination rates and preparedness between advanced economies and the rest. You've already uh, you've already uh, mentioned the difference in the level of fiscal intervention that's possible between advanced economies and the rest. Does this mean we're going to get, when the recovery eventually comes, we're going to get a two-speed recovery as well? You're exactly right. This is going to be a two-speed recovery and vaccination policy is at the heart of it. That's why, uh, as you know now, uh, you know, we have this motto that, you know, vaccination policy is economic policy. Uh, IMF has been pushing this uh, for a long time now. Uh, we talked before about my vaccination paper that we did uh, very early on, actually, January of this year, uh, documenting how these vaccination problems, unequal global vaccinations, is going to be a big problem for us in terms of supply chain disruptions. Uh, our work from January 2021. So here uh, we are in the middle of that two-speed recovery because of first and foremost, because of this unequal global vaccination. Now you have that unequal global vaccination. On top of that, you add this unequal fiscal stimulus, right? Fiscal stimulus, of course, is going to make the supply chain problem worse because you are completely, you know, skyrocketing the demand, right? I mean, so you are pressuring even more that already pressured uh, supply chain. So uh, it is going to make the uh, two-speed recovery, uh, you know, worse in a sense for emerging markets, right, than developing countries. They have low fiscal space. They don't have access to vaccines. And on top of that, like the, yeah, almost like a triple whammy here for, again, emerging market and developing countries, if the Federal Reserve starts normalizing the monetary policy. Now, these normalizing demand and supply chain issues created this inflation problem. And if the Federal Reserve and then ECB, so advanced country central banks react to that and start normalizing the monetary policy, we know that this is going to have really, really bad effects on emerging markets. I mean, we, we saw this movie before. We lived this through before, this, this uh, type of, uh, you know, developments before because of their high risk premium with the normalization of the advanced country monetary policies. Their borrowing cost is going to increase. Their external financing cost is going to increase, which is going to make the two-speed recovery even more asymmetric. And it's going to make the life very difficult for emerging markets and developing countries. As you say, we've seen this movie before. And I do remember talking to you about the differences in vaccination rates and the impact that will have. Sometimes it's not, it's problematic to be right, isn't it? But, uh, well, Chebnam, thank you very much for your work on this. And Let's hope for a good recovery for all countries next year. Thank you, Tim. I hope so, too. The paper is called Fiscal Policy in the Age of Covid. Does it get in all of the cracks? And the authors are Pierre-Olivier Gorinches, Shebnem Kalemli Oshkan, Veronika Penchakova and Nick Sander. You can download it using this link. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you soon. <laughs>